how to do achievement standard 2.1 for physics step-by-step -step instructions as of any video okay you can come down the bottom and you can pause fast forward and rewind you can also change the speeds so you can make me go slow and make me go fast step number one identify your variables your independent dependent and control so the independent is the one that you change dependent is the one that you measure or depends on the independent and controlled are the ones that you keep the same okay you have to figure out which ones are significant um, and why you need to control them and how you need to control them. Most variables you need to be controlled. You're changing one, and you're measuring the other. Step number two, you need to think about scraps. Okay, we're dealing with uncertainties. You need these for merit. Okay, so we've got scale selection error, calibration error, repeating and averaging, approximate theory, parallax, and zero. So you have this worksheet, okay, that goes through scraps. Okay, if you don't have this worksheet, feel free to pause the video and have a look at it. Um, something we don't take into account so often is approximate theory, so where we negate friction um, or other physics principles like poor connections. If you don't have a copy of this sheet, it's attached at the bottom of this video. Something that's really important in physics is to repeat an average. Say for a pendulum, it's common to record for 10 oscillations and then divide that by, by 10 and it reduces the reaction time or the percentage error of the reaction time of the observer. In physics, we're looking for high accuracy and high precision. Okay, We're wanting to reduce systematic errors Okay, that cause all our data to be too small or too high, things like zero error and parallax error. But we also want all our data to be clumped together as well, so to have high precision. Things like human error um, are things that we don't really give credit for, so you can pause the video now and see if you can find six different mistakes. And here they are here, so we've managed to find eight, although a couple might be very similar. Okay, but human error you don't get any credit for. Things we're looking for is to ensure that we've got the right scale. Okay, because it's in the 30 volt plug, we're looking at the top outer layer. But if you're only measuring, say, 2 volts, then you should definitely be in the 15 and probably in the 3 as well to get the most accurate result. Calibration error, when two things are simply not measuring the same, two rulers are wrong, two thermometers are saying different temperatures. Parallax errors, when we look at a measurement from a wrong angle and get an incorrect reading. Zero errors, when our device is not reading zero when it should be, when it's disconnected or when there's no mass attached or etc. So you can get a zero error that is reading too low, you can get a perfect measurement and a zero error that's reading too high. Now we're up to step number three. So now next step is to look at the theoretical formula. In our case it is d equals a half at squared because the equation that we're going to be doing is a rolling trolley for the purpose of this video and the aim is to find the relationship between the distance traveled and the time taken for a trolley to roll down a slope and to use this relationship to find the acceleration of the trolley. So we have d equals a half at squared and we also have time equals the square root of two divided by a times the square root of time. Both of those our equivalent formulas are just being rearranged and the idea of this experiment is to find out A which is the acceleration of the trolley and not of gravity. So let's have a look at our variables, what's our independent, what is the thing that we're changing? The thing that we're changing is the distance our um, trolley travels. Okay, and so what's the relationship between distance and time? Well, do we see that distance and time and time is squared? So distance is going to be proportional to time squared and we could write that using our little crazy fish, D is proportional to time squared. All the the opposite is true, time is proportional to the square root of distance, okay? So t is proportional to the square root of d, and we have to ask what axis we're going to plot this on. Well, our independent x, our independent variable always goes on our x-axis, because we can think of lots of people who have died for independence, and there's lots of crosses, and x um, looks like a cross, and it's also got the word across, A-C-R-O-S-S, so it goes across. So question number five on our sheets are quite commonly set the relationship between distance and time. And so we have distance is proportional to time squared, but to get rid of that proportional sign and to put an equals, we have to put a value in here. And when we've got a straight line graph, that value is our gradient. The same is true for our other relationship. We've got time is proportional to the square root of d. To get rid of the proportional sign and make it an equals, we've got to add a number. And that number is our gradient when um, we have a straight line graph and so this is great for when d is on your y-axis and t squared is on your x and the opposite is true when t is on your y and the square root of d is on your x okay and so this is giving us a straight line that's how we can get the gradient 
If it's not a straight line, then you can't do it. Okay, that's the whole purpose of transformation is to get straight lines. So it's in the form y equals mx plus c. But what's on our y-axis is d, and what's on our x-axis is say t squared. And we tend not to have c's. Our c is a y-intercept. It tends to go through zero. So that's why our equations work so nicely. Step number four: collect accurate data using the correct experimental procedures and take into account all sources of error and to the correct number of significant figures. In physics, we expect to have five different variables. Okay, we notice that for zero distance, then it shouldn't really be going anywhere, so there'll be zero time. Notice how my table is nicely set up with distance being the physical quantity, d, and the units is meters for distance. So time, the unit is the value, the physical value is t, with the units being seconds and square brackets, yes. We can go away and do the experiment. And come back and now we've got some values um, so we can see that the average time I've done it three times and got repeated and averaged from this data I'm now going to draw an average time this is distance graph and I get a curvy graph because this is curvy I now need to be able to linearize it step number seven is to linearize your data and you do that in your table first and then you plot a linear graph so we need to see what our graph is going to look like if it was going up like this would it be a parabola and to make that into a linear graph we would have to square whatever the values on our x is it does look like this it looks like a square root graph and so to make it into a straight line we're going to have to square the values of the x not just the scale here but the actual values in our table if it was this it would be a 1 over x which so would make our values on x 1 over x if it was like this, it would be a 1 over x squared, or a 1 over the square root of x. Often it's very difficult to see on a graph, is it a 1 over x, a 1 over x squared, or the 1 over the square root of x. And so that's where it comes to looking at the theoretical formula on your sheet, which you'll always be given. Once we've square rooted all our values, we then can plot those, and we can get a graph of time versus a square root of distance. And this does look like a straight line, so I can add a trend line to that. For all our graphs, we need to have a gradient triangle. So if we count across here, this is 0 0.2, 0 0.4. And if we count up, it's 0 0.68. Gradient is rise over run, so the change in y divided by the change in x. So it went up 0 0.68, and it went across 0 0.4. And if we type that into the calculator, we get an answer of 1.7, which is very close to what the computer had figured out for me. But we see this equation that the computer's done is y and x, but our axes are not actually in y and x they are in time measured in seconds and the square root of distance measured in the square root of meters so we need to change the y to a t and that x to a square root of d we now have to think well what is the unit for our gradient of 1.7 well it's pretty much whatever's on your y divided by whatever's on your x so the units on our y are seconds and the units on our x is the square root of meters so the unit for our gradient is seconds divided by the square root of meters and we can write that in a simplified form with s divided by the square root of n so now let's find the acceleration of the car so the theoretical equation given us on the front page is t equals the square root of 2 over 8 on the square root of d and the equation we've just figured out from our graph is time equals 1.77 2 times the square root of distance. Now if we notice something here, our time and our time are the same, and our square root of distance and our square root of distance are the same, so that means whatever's in that bracket is also equal to 1.772. So we can write that. So 1.772 equals the square root of 2 over a. Now we just need to do some maths and square both sides, and that gives us this number squared and we remove the square root. Now I need to swap the a and the 1.772, so it becomes 2 over 1.772 squared equals a uh, and now we simply type that into our calculator and we get 0 0.637 meters per second per second I know a number you're pretty good when it comes to math so you can see that theoretical equation and you can simply rearrange it um, by doing some maths and you get this equation a equals 2d over t squared and you ask well why can't I just get some numbers from my table and plug them into this equation and calculate acceleration why do I have to bother with all of those graphs and it is a pretty good question so for instance we could use this 0.4 and the 1.06 and plug it into the equation and we'd get 2 times 0 0.4 which is the distance divided by 1.106 which is our time and we get an answer of 0 0.654 which is very close to our actual answer so why graph? Because finding the gradient 
of the best fit line of your straight line is an advanced averaging technique and it's used to mitigate any extreme value so there might be some outliers um, and it's also used to guarantee that the experiment data does agree with the expected theoretical trend okay your data might not actually follow a trend that might have a curve when it's meant to be straight after you've linearized it um, that's really important and also because the achievement standard says you have to and without um, doing it the graphing way um, you will fail if you just grab two values out of your table and try and do that for your value then you will in fact actually get it wrong so here's some other good resources that you may like to look at this PowerPoint is also be attached to the video I hope that gives you a bit more of a better idea of how to do achievement standard 2.1 and all the best of luck and God bless